testimonies to talk shows. All are made possible because of viewer support for Revelation Foundation. Thank you for making it possible. joy to welcome you to another edition of Heroes of the Faith and with me again today is a uh, very special friend Colin Urquhart. Colin, lovely to have you. Thank you so much for being with us and if you haven't watched one before let me tell you that Colin is uh, the founder and uh, apostolic leader of Kingdom Faith Church as well as being a leader in the charismatic movement in the 60s and 70s and really acknowledged as a, a speaker at conferences and, and a writer and broadcaster and we could go on about so many different areas Colin good to have you yeah. well it's very good to be here Colin we, we, I, I just said in the introduction there you're a leader of of what we call the charismatic movement in the 60s and 70s where there was like a, a fresh outpouring of, of the Spirit of God upon, upon our, our nations. And uh, it, it had such a dynamic effect at the time. And yet, somehow, it hasn't made a, an impact in the world in which perhaps you and, and maybe many people thought that it would have done. Well, I never actually called myself a leader of the charismatic movement. That's, you know, how people boxed me. Mm -hmm because my heart really has been for revival rather than just for a movement of the spirit, you know. Uh, I think really the charismatic movement never became revival. If it had become revival, then it would have made the kind of impact on the world that was needed. Um, but it was very, very significant at its time because it was a bringing back uh, to life of the church. The Holy Spirit was almost rediscovered. That's how it seemed at the time. Mm -hmm. And that was the kind of language people were using at the time. Now, of course, a whole generation has, has been brought up post that movement because really by the end of the 80s that, that movement has, uh, had, had ceased to be. I mean there were sort of remnants of it and, and still there is the fruit of it in many many churches today but there's not the same vibrancy and hunger for God and for his word that there was at that time and that, that's the thing I remember. People were so hungry for God, they were so hungry to be taught uh, that um, they would sort of abandon everything just to meet with God, to hear from God, to be taught the scriptures. It was a very, very wonderful time. So what happened if, if there was a movement of God like you've just described and revival didn't come because of it, is it because Christians at the time boxed the Holy Spirit in and tried to, to tell the Holy Spirit which way to go? Well, I think a serious mistake was made when the leadership the national leadership decided to promote denominational renewal. Anglican renewal, Catholic renewal, Methodist renewal, Baptist renewal, every other kind of renewal. Because the genius of the Holy Spirit in the early days of that movement was to transcend all those differences. And you would have all these conferences and meetings and citywide meetings and so on taking place all over the country and nobody could have cared anything about which church you came from or what group you belong to. The Holy Spirit transcended our differences. It was as if the prayer of Jesus, Father may they be one so that the world will know, was, was really being answered. And then it was sort of back to our denominational enclaves. And I believe that it was something that David Watson and I at the time tried to resist but it was like going against an almost inevitable tide and I believe that really marked the beginning of the end of, of the charismatic movement. Yes, God did work obviously through those denominational meetings but 
somehow the freshness of what the Spirit was doing uh, was tarnished because I believe man took something that was so much of God into his own hands. And that's really what happens in nearly every move of God. Man takes over and then we don't see the same impetus. If there was a group of Christians who were sitting here and we began to talk about where the Spirit of God was moving, some people maybe would talk about China, some people would talk about South Korea or, or South America, Do, but, but almost inevitably it would be not much is happening in the United Kingdom and, and in Western Europe. Do, do you see signs of the Spirit of God moving today in our nation? Oh yes. Um, there are some very interesting things happening in the nation. Uh, there are some churches which are confronting the situation, new churches which are confronting the situation now in a way that people like myself and others were confronting the situation 40, 45, 50 years ago. Uh, so it's almost as if the wheel has turned full circle and that what began as a charismatic movement of the spirit has become charismatic religion and so now that charismatic religion is needing to be confronted and there are a number of really anointed men of God uh, around the nation that are doing that. They're doing it in a very different way from what happened uh, 40 years ago because it's a different situation. But the same need is there and just as happened with us all those years ago at the beginning, there was a lot of opposition, especially from churches. So these new leaders are experiencing a lot of opposition from people that have become stuck in their ways, even in their, in inverted commas, charismatic ways. Uh, because the church has got to break out into the community if we are really to impact the world in the way that God intends. Well, I saw a quote in uh, the Economist, Economist Intelligence Unit which said, Britain is suffering a huge loss of faith in its politicians and ruling institutions. And it talks about the scandal of parliamentary expenses, banking, LIBOR, fixing, payment protection scams, police cover up, and so it goes on. I mean, we live in a fallen world. We live in a, a, a a world which has got moral decay. We live in a, in a world where nobody seems to accept uh, responsibility. It's always somebody else's fault. As, as you look at our, our, our nation and, and Western Europe, um, do you feel despondent? I, I feel concerned for the church because according to my Bible, we are supposed to be salt for the world, light, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden and it's not our fault that the world is as it is because that's simply the flesh being the flesh but we as the church have not had the impact that we could and I believe should have on the world around us and that can only mean that we've got to set our house in order and not just say, well, the politicians and the economists and others have got to set their houses in order. Uh, if we were radiating the light, the life, the love, the power that we should be as the church, then I believe we would not be the ridicule of the nation, but the hope of the nation. And the nation would be saying, well, there's all this stuff going on in the world, but we see something so different, so lovely, so vibrant, so significant, so important in the churches. Come and help us. And that is happening in a few localities, but it's certainly not happening across the nation. But really, I think if you look at God's purpose for his church, that is what should be, could be happening. But that means that we've got to get before God and uh, ask Him to revive us so that we can then have the impact on the nation that He wants us to have.
The implication of what you've just said is that, that, that our role is, is to be concentrating on what's happening in the church and the reviving of the church. Are, are you saying, therefore, that Christians shouldn't get involved in politics and shouldn't get involved in, in, in the issues of the day and speaking into those issues? Not at all. I mean, our church is very much involved in the world, in the political scene, Westminster and locally. Um, uh, no, no, I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is the church has got to get hold of God and, God has, and we've got to let God get hold of us so that we can then have the Im or more impact. And yes, if God opens up opportunities as he has for us, and, and I pray he will continue for us, then we will use those to the full. But I mean, that's a minute part of the total scene. It's actually significant. Some of the things that have happened are very significant, although I wouldn't talk about them publicly. But um, uh, I believe that that is an indication of the kind of impact that it's possible for us to have, even in today's society. But it is a question of, of how much we allow the Spirit of God to actually radiate and almost be expressed and, and, and be able to flow through our lives and out of the church into society like rivers of living water. Just sticking with the, the state of the nation for a moment of time, as you talk with other uh, national leaders, as you listen to what the prophets are saying, uh, do you have fear about the state of our nation at this moment? No, if, if you're a person of faith, there's no place in fear, for fear. Uh, you, you have concern, obviously, but then you've got concern for all the lost uh, because you don't want anybody uh, to be in that position spiritually. Um, but being fearful isn't going to get us anywhere. Uh, the perfect love of God casts out all fear. So uh, it, it's, it's not a question of, of being afraid for the, for the nation, but of saying, well, God, please, work in us, do in us as your people, as your church, as your body, whatever you need to do so that we can have the impact on the nation that you want us to have. We really can be light for the world, salt for the earth, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Many folks uh, are saying, well, the church just seems to no longer have any influence, any impact. Um, so many of the laws that are coming into being are, are, are laws which are doing away with what scriptures have to say. Um, how do we make an impact as a church? What, what's, what's our role as a church in society today? Well, I think there's been a steady decline. Uh, I can, I've been ordained 50 years now. And, and, you know, when I was first ordained, there was great respect for the church. There was great respect for the clergy in, in our society. And what you've had on television over many years is a ridiculing of the church, a ridiculing of the clergy, even, you know, some sitcoms, which actually, you know, people think are funny, well, we've got to be able to laugh at ourselves, they say, but actually they're ridiculing the church, and the church is the body of Christ. It is not something to be ridiculed. So what has happened uh, over a period of time is the... Uh, even, if, if you like, the witness of the church to the nation has been undermined. Now, uh, that, that, that is a work of the enemy, quite obviously. And we don't need to help the enemy to do that. But this is where our focus all the time has got to be on the head of the church, who is, of course, Jesus Christ. Because the body is to reflect the life in the head. And the question really is, well, how much do we truly reflect the radical nature of Jesus Christ? I mean, he was radical, but he wasn't political. If, if you look at the Gospels, Jesus was not political. He didn't take that stance. He was aiming at the hearts of people. He was, um, he knew that if, if, if the heart is changed, then everything in a person's life is going to be changed. And therefore, obviously, if that happens corporately to a number of people, you're going to see things changed in, in a corporate dynamic. 
So, uh, you know, it isn't a question of, well, let's begin a Christian political party or a Christian newspaper or something like that that is suddenly going to change everything, because it won't. But what would happen if we had, as we're believing for, revival for a generation that will change our society, that will really impact our society? All we have got as the church is the most spiritual weapon of all, and that is the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit and the Word of God working together. We can't try to be more political than the politicians or cleverer than the financial wizards. Uh, we have got to understand we are a spiritual people and the only answer to our society actually is a spiritual answer because the politicians sure don't have an answer. The financial guys don't have an answer. Nobody out there has an answer, but we do. But <laughs> at this moment, you know, we're not strong enough in our witness to be able to be the answer that I believe God wants us to be. I was just thinking while you were um, speaking there, 1 Timothy 2, and it says, doesn't it, I exhort first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So in other words, it's as we pray for those in authority that, that peace uh, and tranquility is going to come into the society in which we live. Yes. <clears throat> you see, I don't think that we as Christians should get all downcast because uh, in the nation laws are being passed with which we as believers do not agree. Nothing in heaven has changed. God hasn't changed. The word of God hasn't changed. The spirit of God hasn't changed. Whatever the world does cannot impact God and should not impact us. So we don't need to be all downcast and say, isn't it dreadful? It's the world being the world. What do we expect the world to do but be the world? And yes, we can, we can uh, deplore the fact that laws are being passed that to us are against the scriptures, against the will of God and against the purpose of God. But that doesn't change God. It doesn't change the will of God. It doesn't change the purpose of God. And we know the last chapter. We know what will happen in the end. And God will vindicate the truth. He is the God of justice and everything will in the end come out right. There's going to be things, if you believe the book of Revelation, things are going to get much worse before that happens. So I think if people get all downcast about what's happening now, what are they going to do when things get even worse? <laughs> But in all that, God will have his people of light, people of life, his faithful witness. It seems to be that society almost at times is more spiritual in, in, in the sense of believing in the supernatural than the church is. We see it in our films, we see it in the, in, in the books that people can buy from the, the bookshops and so on, but, but the supernatural and the mystic and the spiritual. And, and yet as a church... We, we concentrate on, on the hymns and the prayers and the, and, and the teaching and the like and, and, and actually forget that there's a whole spirit world out there. Well, I think that's true in many churches. I mean, again, we right. mustn't generalize. Um, but you see, what is operating in the world is what the scripture calls the spirit of this world, which is a false spirit, which is a deceptive spirit. So, of course, the world believes in these false spirits and, and you find all the popular films and books which are really based upon the occult are all part of that massive deception. Uh, yes, the power and authority that we have in the name of Jesus is greater than any of the power of the enemy. But if we're not moving as God's people in faith and in that power and in that authority, then we will not have the impact and effect that we could have. You know, if a person has authority, that is absolutely, totally meaningless unless he uses that authority. And what you're saying 
is the church does not use the authority that God has given. That may be because there are many people in the church that don't believe they have that authority. They don't have any revelation of that authority. Or they don't have the anointing in their lives to use that authority. But nevertheless, Jesus gave to his disciples authority over all the powers of the evil one. So, we have that authority. It is for us to exercise that authority. And would you say that an individual has that authority as well as the, the church leadership? Well, all those who are genuine believers obviously have that authority. It, it's part of the whole package of what God has done in our lives. All those who live in Christ and who have Christ living in them have the authority of his word and spirit in their lives. But of course, when it comes to national things, then this is a, a business for national leadership. Uh, it's a corporate thing. It's not just one individual being able to take on all the powers of darkness that are trying to impact our nation. We need the church to rise up in the power of the Spirit to overcome. After all, you, uh, you look in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, the letters that were sent to the churches, and what does it say at the end of every letter? That, that all the promises belong to those who overcome. So don't let's downcast, let's overcome. If we see there's more to overcome, that's a greater challenge to us, but presumably that means there'll be a greater reward. <laughs> but when you look at society, it's very easy to get downcast and to, to, to get miserable about what's happening and to, to look at the church and feel even more depressed about it. If, if you were going to encourage us, Colin, um, with what it, God is doing and what is happening, how would you do that? Well, I'm trying to encourage you now, really. I'm saying, look, that's just the world being the world. Let us focus on the Lord. Let us focus on what he wants to do in us so that locally, regionally, nationally, we can have a greater impact. Um, you know, our f you, you don't get any faith from the world. All you get is unbelief, deception, fear, and all those negative things. So faith comes from hearing the word of God. All our encouragement comes from the promises of God. Uh, so let us keep our focus on him because that's what the scripture tells us to do. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Well, let's obey him and fix our eyes on him, not the world. Because if we're going to impact the world, it's only because Jesus, as the head, is flowing through his body and he is doing things in the world that we, in our natural strength, just cannot do. And that's where the supernatural then comes in and God Absolutely. does the most amazing things. The supernatural is part of that. But, you know, everything begins with faith. Jesus says, without faith you cannot please God. The, the, the Word of God makes that absolutely clear. But, you see, what, what did Jesus himself say? He said that um, uh, nothing is impossible for God, but he also said all things are possible for he who has faith. Now, we often quote that nothing is impossible for God, but we don't so often quote all things are possible for he who has faith. But Jesus said that also. So as the body of faith, the household of faith, which is what the church is supposed to be, we should say, well, now, this is not an impossible situation. If we're in the position of faith in God, we can actually overcome what the enemy is seeking to do in the world. But it's not just being opposed to this, that, or the other thing. We're talking about people. Our, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers of darkness that are at work in heavenly places and in this world. It is a spiritual battle. And how can we undertake the spiritual battle against those forces that are manipulating men, manipulating politicians, manipulating in the financial markets? How can we overcome those spirits except in the dynamic of the Holy Spirit who is greater than those spirits? Mm. Colin, there's so many things that we, we haven't had time to ask you about. If I just ask you one or two quick fire questions now, how, how, does, how do you, Colin, relax? What do you enjoy doing? Well, I, I'm an artist. I, I paint. That's my uh, real hobby. Um, when I'm not too tired. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find as you get a, a little older, you know, uh, your ministry makes you a little bit more tired. And so I, I don't always uh, 
you know, feel like painting. But that's, that's my, my great hobby. Okay, and as a preacher and teacher, you clearly study the Word a great deal. But do, do you have a personal pattern for your study? Do you read a, uh, the Bible every year all the way through? What, what do you do? No, I don't do that. I, uh, I ask the Holy Spirit to show me what he wants me to focus on uh, at any given moment. That may be a book of the Bible. It may be a theme. It's usually much more thematic, really talks to me about a particular subject and then take me through all the scriptures about that particular subject uh, because that is what he wants me to be speaking and preaching about that is uh, if you like his word for the moment because if we listen to the spirit you know in our local churches and even in our own lives he's not going to be saying something different about a different topic every day he's always going to be addressing a, a particular issue until that issue is being expressed in our lives. Uh, that's true in the church, it's true in us personally. Colin, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming and being our guest on Hero of the Faith, and may the Lord continue to bless you in a mighty way. And I want to say thank you to you too. God bless you all. Bye bye. The program you've been watching was made possible because of your support for the Revelation Foundation. Programs take time, effort and money. If you'd like to make similar programs possible, then please send your gift to the Revelation Foundation. The details are on the screen. Ships is a unique organization because it is bringing services to countries that would otherwise never be able to access their services. It gives us the flexibility to bring first world health care to uh, the developing world. The diseases and medical conditions we encounter are the diseases of poverty, abject poverty. Much of what we address would not be there if it weren't for the level of poverty in these nations. The millions of people who either physically or financially do not have access to health care are staggering. People say to me, well, there's all these millions. How do you think you can change that? And we can change the individuals one life at a time. that need help, you realize that they have no way of getting help. And I want them to know that they're loved. Love is a language that doesn't need words all the time. You can show compassion and care for them. volunteers and I think that's part of what makes it beautiful is people come to here with just a heart to serve and a heart to make a difference and so that makes it a great environment. After the rejection and the ridicule hard lives that they've had up until this point, and to have a ward full of nurses and the other ship staff, people just pour out so much love on them. Love does make a difference. Every single patient that comes in here does come away with not only physical healing, but also emotional and spiritual healing as well. What happens in their hearts is really what changes them, and that's what I think empowers them to go home and be people and to get jobs and to go to school and to believe in themselves. This is really the setting that Mercy Ships fits into. Bringing this hospital ship in, which is a state-of-the-art platform, surgeons, nurses, professionals from all over the world, offering this free of charge at the highest standards is unique. We're working hard here to leave a legacy of improved health care. We can stand in the gap while we uh, encourage the development of the health care systems in the nations in which we serve. Mercy gets very much the concept of training. We're always trying to do ourselves out of a job. That's perfect, really, because, you know, they've got the skills and they kind of get the program. That's kind of the aim, really. We want the day to come when all the nations on Earth 
are able to care for their people, and we have a long ways to go, especially as we're serving in some of the poorest nations in the world. Revelation Television is committed to making a wide range of Christian television programs. From studies 